Okay. Um, I'm going to open the meeting. This is the Board of Education meeting for which adequate notice under the Open Public Meetings Act was provided by written notice on January 21st, 2020 to the Courier News, the Echo Sentinel, the Star Ledger, Tappan to Warren, and the Clerks of the Borough of Watchung and the Township of Greenbrook, Long Hill, and Warren. Mr. Size, can we have a roll call, please? Dr. Chan? Mr. Fallon? Yes. Mr. Hayek? Yes. Mr. Hunsinger? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Ober? Ms. Potter? Yes. Dr. Shabilsky? Ms. Raban? Yes. And Ms. Brown? Yes. Can you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with the provisions of the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act, be it hereby resolved that the board move into executive session to discuss confidential personnel and legal matters, WHRE negotiations and WHPSA negotiations, after which action may be taken. It is expected that the matters discussed in executive session will be made public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're going to move forward with our agenda. Um, in terms of board correspondence, I really have no correspondence, but I just wanted to give a quick update on regionalization and the grant that we've been talking about. So the superintendent's been in continued contact with the K through eights. We're still working through um, and talking to them about you know how we can potentially coordinate to apply for the grant. In the meantime, the DOE is going to provide us um, tax information, which would be beneficial for us to kind of see what a potential tax impact would be. Some like preliminary dot, uh, information and we'll continue to have the conversation uh, and what I will do even though there's no superintendent's report on here um, just to follow up on the letter that I sent out last week um, regarding COVID-19 uh, I actually was on a call earlier today that the governor hosted uh, with the uh, State Department of Health uh, and they they I'm actually pleased that the information they shared um, wasn't anything new to us because we have been staying updated with this on a daily basis. Um, our county, our Somerset County Department of Health is excellent. Um, they are excellent with updating us. And uh, we actually, um, we had representatives from our district attend a meeting uh, at Warren Township yesterday with um, the representative from the Somerset County Department of Health. Our nurse was there, um, Beth Scheiderman was there because I was unable to attend. Um, and so, you know, similar updates, but the, the uh, DOE as well as the Department of Health um, send us updates on a daily basis. And the updates are really just kind of reminders of precautions, um, which are the same precautions you take during flu season. Those are the same precautions to, to take, to take um, now uh, with the coronavirus that is just to be clear again, there are no cases in New Jersey. Um, there, they did, uh, recently now have a case uh, in New York, um, and that was talked about on the call today. And obviously we are in close proximity to, to New York, people commute into New York, but they said they have no reason to believe that, you know, right now there's no uh, impact on New Jersey. And it, again, just reminding everyone to take the same precautions with um, the flu. They also reiterated that the only severe cases that have been so far from the coronavirus are in older people who have compromised immune systems. Um, very minimal, uh, the, the very few children have actually um, contracted it and it's, they've been very, very mild cases. So they did um, reiterate that on the phone call. Um, our uh, custodial staff uh, has been, you know, increasing some of the frequency which with, uh, with which they clean um, touch points. So on a nightly basis, um, they are cleaning uh, touch points with disinfectants, so doorknobs, light switches, handles, all of those types of things. We purchased additional disinfectant wipes and hand sanitizer for classrooms. Um, just looking to see if there's any other notes. Um, and they did say that if they, you know, if anything changes with regard to um, New Jersey and the status of any cases here, that they will immediately notify the county health departments who immediately notify us. Uh, the communication really has been on a daily basis, sometimes even multiple times um, within the day, just when they find other resources and, and they want to keep us up to date. Um, we. We were fortunate as well that we, uh, you know, utilize Google Classroom throughout the school, throughout the departments. So we certainly do not encourage children to come to school if they're not feeling well. Um, and that goes for, for any illness, uh, you know, with the, whether it's the flu, whether it's a cold, and the same thing for staff. Um, uh, learning is able to continue for students when they're not here because we do have so much virtual learning set up. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that came up on the call today was if, 
you know, what would happen if schools were to close because of this. Again, they don't anticipate that needing to happen, um, but, but you know, they, they did say that um, certainly there'd be a lot more conversation around that, but schools are much better to equip um, increased absences um, or even, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the very slim chance of any kind of school closure related to this because there are so many online platforms for learning. Um, so that we utilize now when students are out or if they're on home instruction. So in that worst case scenario, mm -hmm. and hopefully we don't get there, right? Mm -hmm. but readiness is about being mm -hmm. ready for the hopefully unlikely event. So exactly. Do close, exactly. Do, are we prepared for continuing education through virtual? Mm -hmm. And that's what we are talking about right now, just to, to um, formalize some of those details. Um, but I'm very confident that, that we would be able to do that. We have students um, when they're out for periods of time that are too short for them to be on um, Formal home instruction with a you know where we put them on Edgesphere or they have a home instructor, they're able to to utilize Google Classroom and the teacher communicates. We have teachers who are out you know now for their own reasons and they'll be communicating with the students live via Google yes. Classroom when there's a sub in the classroom. So we we are so much better equipped to do that than we were years ago. You know H1N1 was in the late 2000s, about 2008 2009 I believe, um, and that was much worse than than this is. And you know we did not certainly did not have the capability to continue instruction virtually as we did then. Um, so we or we didn't have the the capability then as we do now. So. Um, so that's something that we're, uh, you know, making sure that we're prepared to do should it come to that. Um, but we're, you know, we're staying updated every day. Um, and the, the state is doing a very good job of, of supporting school districts and, and making sure that they keep us in the loop on everything. And we had, we had that same issue, or the discussion came around, I guess, when, when Sandy mm -hmm. hit. Mm -hmm. And we had so many districts that were out and you know, schools trying to figure out ways to be able to do virtual learning. Mm -hmm. The difference in the deployment of technology back from 2012 versus today, you know, is is night and day. Yeah, totally. I mean, the technology is here. It's just a matter of, I think, formalizing it. Mm -hmm. So again, in the hopefully unlikely mm -hmm. situation, it's a matter of flipping the switch and everybody knows how to switch to virtual mm -hmm. and you know, keep things going, mm -hmm. so. And then just one other <laughs> update slash reminder. Oh, okay. did you have something? Does this mean the end of snow days? Uh, yeah. that, that's actually that's been talked about. I know every student's worst Jordan nightmare, we right? Do that. Uh, well, right now, New Jersey does not have anything in place um, for a virtual day actually counting as a, as a day of school. Um, but it's something that they've been talking about since Sandy, um, and you know this may may kind of bring that conversation. To, I know it's every every kid's worst nightmare, right? If you miss any kind of real time for like something like coronavirus, they're going to have to let it count towards the. You would th right now. There's nothing in place for that. Yeah, well, they need to get on that. Um, so, work on that, Bob. No, I think this was on with the governor today, yes. and they were talking about it. So. They did. They that, that got brought up. That's a joke. So, uh, do we entertain <laughs> students to wash their hands in the cafeteria before they eat? We, we, it ha so that was in the letter that I sent out that is being re emphasized in classes and health classes. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Right. <laughs> yes. And don't buy masks. Yes. 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 Um, maintenance staff uh, and our custodial staff, our nursing staff is very on top of this. And they're on top of this regardless of whether there's some um, specific virus that, that is, you know, being talked about, such as coronavirus or just the flu and the cold and colds. They um, monitor the students very closely. They communicate with the parents um, and they keep in, in close contact with us. So uh, uh, Angela Valerio has been involved in the same calls that we've been involved in. We've been inviting her to, to the meetings that we've had, you know, at the township she was on the conference call today um, so they are very very informed um, and they make sure to to be very on top of what's happening in the school in the student population and who they're seeing and to to keep data on that so um, they're an excellent resource for the students and the staff some students they put the pen in their mouth you know, I hope that. You're <laughs> 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 We try. Uh, we try. Yeah. 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 Um, and then just one other um, update slash reminder on the strategic plan. We are in the midst of the engagement phase. And next week, we have uh, several of our forums. So on Tuesday night, we have the live community forum at 7 p.m. that everyone and anyone is welcome to come to. 
uh, that will be facilitated by Dr. Ferguson. On Thursday night, we have our virtual community forum um, that the information is on uh, the website and on the uh, invitation that was emailed out. And I'll be sending a reminder about that out uh, this week as well to everyone with the call-in information. Um, and uh, there's also going to be prior to that uh, at 5.30 p.m. on Thursday, we are trying a virtual forum for our alum. So I sent out the invitation to parents of current students that also have alumni. I also sent it out to our staff, as I know many of them keep in touch with alum, um, so that they can share that with them. Did you get um, any responses? Uh, you know what? We, I didn't ask for RSVPs, oh, so we'll no, see that night no. if they <laughs> if they uh, they call in. Uh, if, even if we look, I, I, if we get five, I'd I'd be happy because that's five more pieces of feedback from alum. Uh, but this actually, what I've gotten feedback from are the staff members. I sent the the invitation out to staff asking them, and a number of them already responded to me of, oh, you know, I have these students that I keep in touch with that I can send it to. So I think that'll be a good way to do it. And I'm also going to be, in the reminder that I send out, I will be sending the link to the HYA survey that they finalized that is ready to go that will be open for a few weeks. So we're in the midst of all of that right now. And the board members can attend these things and not worry about us being in, in a meeting, correct? That's my understanding. It's like, you can, we can all come to the strategic plan meeting. We can all go on the phone call, but that would not be considered a meeting. I, You're asking me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I understand generally, that to be the case. I, just, well, I don't think so. But I, yeah, yeah, as long as you're not talking not, about board as business, as you, right? As long as you're not talking about board business, right, it's almost like right. Atlantic City. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I just don't want anybody to feel like everybody. Board. We can all attend mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. So don't talk about business. Yeah, just don't <laughs> talk about board business and right. you're safe. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, so we've, so now the things that weren't on the agenda, we got those done, so now we can move to the reports that are off Sorry. the agenda. <laughs> I'll stop with the presentation. The moment you've all been waiting for, the budget presentation. I think they were out there with the party on the pasta and dig in. All right. They know the entertainment portion of that. Well, but also the food presentation would be really good. Okay. Um, so I'll start off. Uh, those of you that have been on the board for a few years are, are used to this, although we, we added, we spiced it up a little this year and we brought Anthony Meluso, our, our IT director, so he's going to speak a little bit about some of our, our specific technology inclusions in the agenda. Um, Tim and I do want to express our gratitude to the board. Um, every year they spend a lot of time going through this process um, and, you know, ask us very, very good questions to make sure that we are um, meeting student needs and doing it in the most efficient way possible with regard to use of resources and um, responsibility to the taxpayers. And we think that that's you know, certainly what this budget does. So we always start off just by highlighting our strategic plan goals because those are the main drivers of the budget. Um, and that is what works its way into every conversation we have with all of the various uh, administrators and department heads when they are providing us their rationales for their budget proposals. So the timeline, we are um, partway through here. So March 3rd on there is the second budget presentation to the board. March 17th, uh, is, which is our next meeting, will be the vote on the preliminary uh, tentative budget. March 18th, we send that to the county office. And then uh, April 24th is when we provide official legal notification of the public hearing on the budget, which will be at our April 28th board meeting. One of the things we always start off with are just some of our, our indicators. Um, that we use just to, these are not our end game uh, or our target goal, but they are just indicators of, of moving in the right direction. And our averages, um, you know, certainly consistently stay above the state average. Um, for AP, we continue to um, open access to our AP courses to uh, encourage more students to, to tap into their potential. And our performance, not only do we increase the percentage of students enrolled in AP courses, but our performance has continued to increase um, in the past seven years um, that I've been here and that we've been closely tracking that. Uh, we had 257 students earn uh, recognition or national recognition for AP performance, which is impressive. Um, in terms of just highlighting some of our accomplishments, um, we were named to the AP Honor Roll by the College Board for the third time. And if you recall, I mentioned we were awarded the AP Computer Science Female Diversity Award, and this was the first year they had that award. 
We have four uh, merit, national merit finalists in the class of 2020. We just learned that our semifinalists all became uh, finalists. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously in athletics and co-curriculars, we continue to earn recognition. We're in the midst of um, uh, our wrestling championships uh, and our basketball state championships right now. Um, actually, I realize what I have up here too, I believe that's from um, last year in terms of the, the track and the, the soccer and uh, boys fencing. Um, and in terms of finance, we do very well in that area as well. Um, our AAA bond rating has been for a number of years consecutively, um, and we are continuously looking to expand our shared service agreements uh, for transportation, staff development, purchasing, maintenance. Um, we are now a member of the shift, so that has helped us uh, see savings as well. I'll turn it over to Tim so he can talk about some of the drivers in budget development. Thanks, and we're gonna kind of go back and forth with people, so I feel like we're we're kind of shifting around to keep you awake, but we're working on it. <laughs> so um, just to, and Liz already talked about some of the drivers. Obviously, enrollment's a big driver for us. Um, our enrollment, you'll see later, is dropping, and we've talked about that already. Um, and on the resources, we've talked about some of those. The state aid we did receive on the 27th, we got $221,000 um, more than we got last year. Um, that's, and that's a good thing. Uh, if they had funded the formula, we would have gotten fully, we would have gotten $900,000 more. This was part of the commentary that we have every, when we do our referendums, we say, look, you know, we, we constantly are shorted on our state aid, and this is an opportunity to get that state aid. And in that state aid document, we did get $1.3 million for this project here. The media center, uh, so that was confirmed. So our our total um, aid state aid this year uh, for a debt service was 1.7 million, 300 from the old and uh, from the old referendum, uh, continuing payments, and the 1.3 for this one payment for the note on this project. Uh, and I'll kind of go through that a little bit later because that has an impact on the overall numbers. Um, and then salary and benefits, when, I, um, when we start the budget process, the number one financial driver is gonna be salary and benefits. It's most of our budget. Uh, our health benefits have stabilized, and that is helping us on the other areas in the budget. That allows us to get more technology, it allows us to get more security, capital projects, those kind of things. So the last three or four years, you know, I'm not gonna move when I say it, but it's been very stable. <laughs> And when that's the case, same thing with salaries. Actually, salaries have been dropping because of attrition. Um, when those two things are stable, we can do a lot more in terms of uh, capital projects uh, with helping the taxpayers um, at the same time. So, um, talked about enrollment. It is dropping. Uh, it continues to drop. And I think in the next couple of years, you'll see actually see a little bit more as the Warren enrollment drops start to hit us, um, the significant drops they had. Um, but next year, we're still slightly below 2,000, uh, so we still got a significant amount of students here. Um, and like I said, the salary and benefits kind of drives the financial um, numbers in the budget, and that's been stable, so that's helping us. Next year will be the second year of our three-year contract. This year is our first year. Uh, second year is next year, and I can't believe we'll be bargaining again in a year, so it's great. But it's 3.1% uh, um, was the settlement rate. Um, and like I said, since joining the SHIF, our uh, increases in health care premiums have been below or at 3%. Um, and that's, in this day and age, that's fantastic. Um, if you can kind of keep going like that, it just allows us to do a lot more within this budget. Uh, chapter 78 contributions uh, amount to $1.3 million, so that's a significant number. Um, I know there's legislation that the governor talked about. My understanding is that um, the Senate president is not supporting that, and I hope he continues to do that, because uh, that $1.3 million is significant for us. Uh, I'm going to go back to the superintendent for academic programs and then technology. So just a little highlight on some of the uh, additions to the budget with regard to academic programs. Um, so we are um, 
adding a, a special education teacher. However, we are decreasing a social studies teacher. Um, so our, our net uh, increase in staff is zero. We're, we're balancing it out. It's uh, just with the redistribution of students um, with the, the uh, courses. Uh, we, as you recall, at a, a board, I believe it was the January board meeting on the agenda, you approved a number of new course offerings um, in arts, in English, and in world language. Um, and we also opened up some of our courses to allow freshmen to enroll in them, including robotics um, and sociology. Um, and we do have a, a large number of students, um, I believe it's Long Hill, that has a very active robotics program. So we have a number of students coming in as freshmen that are very interested. Um, so we're, we're happy that we're able to open up uh, that to them. And our um, ELL student population is increasing each year, and so we are uh, expanding that program as well um, and uh, able to um, individualize instruction a little bit better um, within the schedule by uh, having some additional uh, separation of courses so that we can separate the levels. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Anthony Maluso, who is our Director of Technology, and he's going to talk about the technological components of the budget. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so we're going on to year four of our Chromebook initiative, so next year every single student will have a Chromebook, uh, unlike this year where the seniors were using uh, their own devices. So we're hoping that's going to have an impact on instruction. Uh, we're also looking at using E-rate funds. This is the fifth year of the funding. Uh, next year we'll get new funding. And we have some available money here to um, improve our security uh, and management of our network infrastructure, which is, some of it dates back to uh, 2008. So it's out of support, end of life, and we're hoping we can renew this for another 10 years with that. Uh, the 10 uh, new classroom uh, smart boards, before I came here, the decision was to put a smart board in every classroom, and we're coming to the end of, uh, of that project, and we hope that these 10 is closer to that goal of completing that. Um, support instructional laptops, these are for buildings and grounds, um, guidance, uh, special services. Uh, their laptops have reached uh, end of support as well, and they're out of warranty. They're um, about five or six years old. So we're hopefully uh, going to get uh, new laptops in that regard. Uh, desktop replacements for two classrooms. I believe one is the robotics room. Um, it's a new program, and they're using some older ho uh, hardware there. And this will hopefully uh, uh, rejuvenate the program or get it into the next level for next year as it gets to uh, expand and the number of students are in there in, in there as plus the club. Uh, I think that's good. <laughs> You might have to do one more slide, I think. Do I have one more slide? I think it goes on. Oh, no, nope, that's that true. Be, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so the Media Center project is embedded in the budget. That's what makes the budget tricky. As a matter of fact, this budget is probably one of the more complicated ones that I've worked on. Um, we did it a couple, three or four years ago when we did the field. Uh, the numbers are larger, and it, it's kind of a weird thing the way it it's presented. So the books that you have, you'll see the numbers are quite high. And the unique, and I didn't really want to go into the detail of the fund accounting because I'll really put you to sleep, but just to kind of in a, just a brief review, just to show you what I'm trying to explain, it kind of makes it simple. When I, when I was in college, the way I thought of fund accounting was funds in, first of all, gov <laughs> governments in well, and of themselves. Of fund accounting in college. I know, right? <laughs> this <Fun> is, years. <laughs> it's a long time ago. So, um, so, so basically, your government entities have funds instead of just one set of books. Each fund has a unique quality. So your general fund is for your general operating funds. Fund 20, which is special revenue, has grants in and out, right? 30 is capital projects. That's for capital projects like a referendum. So we spend all our money from that fund. And 40 is debt service. Debt service is for paying bonds. So they all act independently. So when we do the budget, what we have to do is we first got to take a withdrawal from our capital reserve. <laughs> Think of that as a bank account. Comes into the budget. Then it goes out. So we got to take it out of fund 10 and put it into fund 40. So we're taking $2 million in, taking it and then sending it out within one fund. And then it goes to fund 40, comes in, and then goes out for paying the bonds. It looks like it comes in twice and goes out twice. So our numbers are doubled uh, for this one transaction. 
That's why I say, so when you look at the numbers, the total numbers, you're like, oh man, the budget went up 15%. No, it did not go up 15%. <laughs> it's just the unique quality of fund accounting and how we got to account for it that makes it look like that. This entire thing is exactly what the board envisioned. You know, this project, this media center project. We basically have $2 million coming in from capital reserve, a million three, or two million and about two million and five coming in from capital reserve, a million three from state aid. That's paying for the entire project, $3.8 million. So it's exactly what you asked for, it's exactly what you presented to the public. It just unfortunately comes into the budget in, in, in steps, which kind of makes it look weird. But it really worked out exactly the way you wanted to plan it. So that's a good thing. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's part of the budget. And you, you could see that in the numbers. And I'll show you a slide later that kind of plays that out. Um, the ESIP program, which is not part of this budget, the work will be started next year. Um, so they're going to be start doing some lighting work. Um, the financing starts in 21-22, so it's almost like a lease purchase, a long-term lease purchase is how it's played out. And it's paid for by the saving, your energy savings over time. So that's kind of how that works. But you won't see anything in next year's budget, but the work will start getting done. So just kind of alerting you to that. It's pretty cool. Um, and one thing we did when we got more, we got $200,000 more in state aid. And when I talked to the operating committee, our health care was at seven, I think seven and a half percent. Well, that dropped uh, after discussion with the shift, um, and the numbers broke well for them. We, it dropped below three percent. So what we did was we started out putting five hundred thousand dollars into capital reserve to replenish that. Mm -hmm. uh, we added three more, so we came up to eight hundred thousand dollars. So what we're trying to do is put more money into capital reserve for a future project just like this one, where we can get that state aid like that. So um, the project we're looking for, and the one we really are excited about if we can save up the money, is the steam lab. Um, right now, you know it as the robotics room um, and that general area. But we're working on the, with the architect to come up with a plan that's um, a little more efficient than what we had in the uh, five-year plan. I think the five-year plan was like $5 million or something like that. Anyway, it was, it, was, it was a little bit more than we were looking for. So we, we were just trying to um, make it a little simpler and try not to move as many classrooms around. But anyway, that's the reason why we put the money in capital reserve. And half of that state aid money that we got, uh, I said 200000 we put 100 into this capital reserve. Half of it we put into tax savings because we always have a mind for the taxpayers, right? We're always trying to help them out. Um, anyway, so that, that's part of this budget. The rooftop unit in the South Cafeteria we've talked about for a couple of years now. We, were, we originally were going to replace the coils that are bad in there. Um, and then when we hired the new architect, we asked them to look at it. And what their thought process was is to add a rooftop unit and make that a separate unit, which is better and more efficient for us. Because what that does is allows us, when we're not using that room, we can turn it down. We can't turn it off, but we can turn it down to save energy. And it doesn't tax the rest of the, the systems, the boilers and the chillers, when they're heating and air conditioning the other part of the south building. See, right now, the, those boilers and the chiller have to condition and heat the entire south building plus that, that area, which is it's a little taxing on an older system. Anyway, so that's what we did there. The track and field high jump area is the one area when we redid the track and the fields, we did not do. Um, that was a budget decision at that point in time. Uh, it lasted three or four years. It's now not going to last. What's happening is the, there's too many cracks in the pavement, and air is coming up, and we got bubbles. So it's really not a safe spot for them right now. Uh, we've tried to repair, but it's, it's virtually impossible. You repair one, and another bubble pops up here. It's, just, it's the nature of, um, con uh, not concrete, but uh, macadam. It just kind of, that's the way it works, unfortunately. Um, ex interior, exterior door replacement is a security thing that we've been doing piece by piece. One of the things we want to do, and, and a great example is if you, when you leave here and you go to your left, those two doors that are closed like this, they get 
opened and shut all day long and they're beat up. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to tie them into the uh, fire alarm system so that they remain open. So when the students are passing during the day, that you don't get that constant beating of the doors. You know, and, that, and if there were to be a fire, what happens is there's a little clip that closes the doors. Um, that's the only way we can do that to keep them open. We can't legally keep them open with, you know, putting little door stoppers in there. That doesn't work for the fire. But it's, you know, I've, I've been fighting Chris on this one for a while, but I, I'm, I am understanding what he's saying. As I watch the students, if you watch thousands of students pass through these doors, it's, it's like a beat down. But anyway, uh, and then the last thing is um, a, a John Deere tractor. Uh, Chris and I were talking about, uh, we have a, an old case tractor, a 1985 case tractor, and we have a, a 450, uh, F450 Ford truck. Uh, we're replacing those two things that are going out the pasture with one tractor, uh, this new John Deere. We think it accomplishes, this one accomplishes everything those two vehicles do. Uh, does that include all the attachments? Yes, it does. So, yeah, because we want to plow with it. Right. And grind yeah. some meat. <laughs> yeah. And make mustard. <laughs> okay. So, security. Um, and we talk about it every year. Our budget, we have a, a resource officer, which we, we maintain, and he's, he's fantastic. We have four full-time and two part-time security guards, um, all retired police officers. Uh, it's one thing that, I've, to me, since I've been here, I, I've been amazed on how far ahead we are of most other high schools. We do a real good job with this, um, and they do a fantastic job. We have um, a video system of 120 cameras. We've replaced almost all of them. Uh, we're putting in $35,000. That's about the, um, that's the last piece of it. It will be a continual uh, update. I can tell you that. Um, we could probably, these will probably last for a while, but at some point in time, we'll have to keep uh, changing cameras. Some of the new ones are pretty cool. They actually, you, you can uh, zone in really close to things that, uh, and get a better picture of what's going on. So that's very helpful for our security guys. Um, and then the one uh, nice thing, if the state follows through, um, is that we're listed as a, getting a grant of 127000 and we want to do that to upgrade uh, our notification system. Um, it's, Speak of the devil. We believe we'll be in, in compliance with uh, Alyssa's law prior to doing that. This goes beyond that, and it does meet the requirements that are in this grant so far. Um, we may have to push this forward I think it opens in April and ends in May, so we're already working with the architect to get that into the, um, to the plan. Um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about the, or is that me? Yeah, you can speak to those. Okay. So um, in our academic area, uh, besides this, this great space here, what we're going to do is uh, one of the big things that our health uh, and PE folks have been talking about, and this is part of our wellness initiative, is the weight room over here by Gym 5-6, uh, replacing the equipment in that room and, and sprucing it up a little bit. Um, the floors right now are um, like this old kind of beat up wooden thing and we're trying to make them almost like the locker room in 7-8, like that soft cushiony type thing. Um, but the, they want to do uh, a little more cardio type weight exercising in there. Um, <coughs> You know, I think that's a good thing. Um, and our phys ed teachers are the ones who are driving the equipment uh, bus on this one, which is great. Um, we have some new instruments in our arts program. Uh, we have a new wrestling mat for our wrestlers. Um, that one, the original has reached its, its max. And our second year in our classroom, um, revising our classroom furniture. Uh, this year, current year, in spring break, they're finally coming in, and we spent a lot of time planning with the teachers. Uh, we have five classrooms going in. Next year, we want to put 10, and we'll see how that goes. And then if people like it, the kids like it, the teachers like it, we'll move forward with more. Uh, and that may be a lease purchase, but um, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Right? Um, in our PAC, our Performing Arts Center, uh, we want to put in uh, stage lighting, which hasn't worked for a long time. Uh, and make that LED and uh, 
improve our wireless communication system that we have there um, to make it a little better for the stage crew to um, handle the, the performances. Um, okay, this is the really exciting stuff. So this is the, this is just a snapshot of the um, operating budget and the revenues and then the expenditures. So as I had mentioned, this is the revenue side. Um, if you skip down to the second to the bottom line, that's that revenue entry I was talking about. Um, and the reason I presented it this way is you'll see it on both slides. You'll see it coming in and going out. Now, prior to putting this in, our, total, our subtotal is we have an increase of 7.4% in our spending budget. Well, I know that's not the case. So if you take out that $2 million, our spending budget operating goes up 2.1%. Um, that number is embedded in that top number, that use of surplus reserves, uh, that $2 million. So that's the impact of the uh, referendum. Uh, we talked about tuition going up 3%, uh, I think one of the meetings. Um, our state aid, it's a 12% jump. It's, I think that's pretty good. Um, I'll take it any day of the week. I would like to get the $900,000, but you know, beggars can't be choosers. And then uh, the tax levy is going up 1.2%, one, actually 1.24% to be precise, but 1.2%, uh, which is below. We're allowed to go 2%. Now, anything we don't use does generate banked cap that you can use at a later time. Um, Again, I don't know if the board is usually into that sort of thing here, but, um, you know, that's something that is available down the road. Hopefully we won't need it. On the expenditure side, same thing, and I have that same entry. You could see that, you know, this is where it goes out. So the, the actual budget increase is a 2.1% spending increase. Um, and that number is embedded in that capital outlay line. Also in that capital outlay line is that deposit to capital reserve of $800,000, just so you're aware. Um, but most of our, our numbers are, are pretty solid. Um, special tuition, you know, I would love to control that even more, but that's a, that's a tough one. That's a little bit out of our control. That's, some, you know, it's not, that's a tough one to control, to be honest. Um, and then I have some per pupil cost comparisons how we do against, uh, compared to schools that are like us. Um, overall, we're, we're second to the bottom on this group. Um, I always kind of like to mention that, you know, obviously region, and it's kind of a weird thing, right? We live in a small state, but region does make a difference, right? <laughs> Northern Jersey and Southern Jersey, and I know that controversial Central Jersey all have a, a different cost per living, but again, we, we still stack up pretty well there. Um, with instruction, I know, I'd love to have that number a little higher, to be honest, but um, we are, it, it kind of falls in line with the total. Our administrative cost is a little higher, um, but that's actually gotten better from last year. I actually went to the right one, so I was real happy about that. And then our co-curricular, which again, I would love to be a little higher. Uh, we're on the low end, but you can see we're on the low end for most of almost everything. Um, and the tax allocation, this one's always tricky to explain, but you guys have been, well, most of you have been through it enough, um, so you kind of get it. So every year, the, the, our piece of, the, the, our, our budget gets apportioned differently to each town based on two things. The change in elementary enrollment versus um, high school enrollment, and then the values of the homes. So in, when the state provided the formula, it's a state-provided formula. When they provided the formula, the one thing that kind of bared out was the Warren elementary percentage went down significantly, and Long Hill's uh, elementary percentage compared to the high school percentage went up. So if their elementary percentage goes down, the high school percentage goes up. That means you get a higher percentage of our tax levy. That's how it works. So that was a factor, for, certainly for Warren. So the percentage, the overall percentage for Warren went up primarily because of that, because their, the values in the homes went down higher than the other two. Wachung was kind of in the middle, but their values went up compared to the other two towns where it went down. 
So, you know, um, it kind of, they, they fell on the wrong side, unfortunately, last year for them. Their uh, enrollment went, as you guys, they are my watch youngers now. So their enrollment went, um, their enrollment percentage went down. So that kind of hurt them last year, and their values went up. The house values went up, so they had a higher percentage. So you'll see that in the next slide. Um, Warren Townships, the average home, about $743,000. Uh, the dollar rate increase on the average home is $111. For watching Borough. Did you type in yes. the second line? It should be, should be a percentage instead of dollar. Oh, okay. Yeah, I apologize for that. Oh, yeah, thank you, Rush. Uh, <clears throat> so um, the, uh, the dollar increase for Warren is $111. The uh, average home in Wachung, 719000 Average price increase, 199 but practically $200. <coughs> Long Hill, um, the Long Hill Township will be very happy to see us again. So they're, they're dollar, they have an average decrease, decrease in the average home is $130 per that average home. So, I mean, again, it's, it's a weird thing on how this allocation changes every year. Uh, but you can see why. If the enrollment changes and your ha the home values change, that's going to change the numbers. So that is all we have. Uh, we will open it up to some questions. So I have a question. Mr. Rich. So uh, the comparative <laughs> charts are quite interesting. Do you have a similar chart for academic performance? Or how does our schools? system compares with other, you know, tier one schools in the state. Or the yes, country. if you look at our, um, I don't know if it was in the fall, we do it in the fall presentation when we do the student performance report. So if you the go, October meeting. Um, and yes, so in the, so it's actually in the board folder um, in the minutes for the October meeting, but it's also posted on our website. I see. Mm -hmm. But where do we stand, you know, and what is our goal, you know, that where do we want to be? I, it, you know what, it's, again, similar to the slides that I, um, when I presented earlier where we use different indicators. Um, it's not something that we, you know, that's a conclusive piece of data, but it's certainly we look at how we compare to our, comp, you know, our comparable districts. And um, one thing I can say is that what we consider our comparable districts has shifted um, in the past uh, seven years. Um, I'm sorry, I look at seven years because that's how long I've been here. But, you know, uh, one of the things that I challenged the staff to do was really have some higher standards for where we think we should be. Um, because when, you know, the initial comparisons we did, we were at the top for everything. So that means we need to move ourselves into a different group um, to compare. And so, uh, you know, with, with regard to AP, um, we do very well with those indicators. With SAT, we do very well. Um, the state testing, we can't really use that as a comparative indicator right now because participation rates vary so, so differently across districts. But what we do use that data for um, is as a catalyst for discussion so that if we see that um, in a particular area, you know, a school district is doing very well and it's an area that we're not doing as well, we find out, okay, what, what programs are you using? What, you know, what is it that you're doing differently? Um, so it's, it's really good information for conversations for us to dig a little deeper. Okay. So I have another question. Do <clears throat> um, you talk about this STEAM labs and media lab? Could you elaborate what, are the, what do they consist of? What is the STEAM labs space you are so, the OK, so the, the Media Center project is something that we, was that last year when last we approved? Year. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the board approved the project for this space right here. I see. Um, it's, it's a significant change to what you see right here. What this project, you know, this is your old style library. Um, a Media Center project, and you see them a lot. I think, as a matter of fact, I think the Warren K-8 to uh, the, the middle school, did, they did revise all there. So it's similar to that sort of project. There's a lot more technology. <clears throat> there's a lot more interactive workspaces for kids. Um, it just modernized the space. It's, it's a significant project. Um, so that, that's what that is. The STEAM Lab is something that, um, right now there's, uh, let's see, there's a robotics class. It's kind of, half robotics and half of a classroom. And the idea is to make that um, more conducive to 
I mean, you could. Well, tell yeah, for that and on. for all of our, um, you know, not just for to. We would likely we've actually debated too whether we would incorporate the robotic space into that or do a new space for robotics. That's what we're in the conversations with right now with the architects, um, but to really have um, some additional classroom spaces. Um, some of them that would be utilized, you know, by by actual classes on a daily basis, but others where um, teachers can take their classes to utilize um, the space and the equipment in those rooms. So that's what we're in the process of, of doing right now. Um, and what we'd be doing is taking some existing classrooms near the robotics room and really making it um, a kind of a steam suite. Um, that you know, uh, that all teachers would be able to, to access and utilize for their classes. But that's a future project. Yes, that's still that's in its early it's phases. Not, yeah, we're, it's we nothing. Just, we're, we're nothing. We approved. we haven't planned that. The board one hasn't. Yet. Yeah, we haven't moved. We're just putting money aside for because that's, that's on that's the, the, the list of projects. Because that's this team includes science, technology, math. So I'm wondering whether you would be. Uh, renovating your physics lab, chemistry lab, biology labs. I don't know if you have those labs. We wouldn't be, so have one of the things we talk about, we have yeah, newer labs in the building and we have older science labs, um, and that's certainly on the list. Um, but with this, you know, it's, it, there, there may be a more advanced lab that those teachers could bring their classes to, you know, to use. Um, it, it's similar to when schools started putting computer labs in that teachers could sign up to go and use. Uh, you know, for, for for depending on what they were doing in that particular class that day, and that's what we're looking for um, the steam lab. That you know, if the robotics is in there, so that those classes are taking place in there, but there'd be other spaces as well that teachers could utilize. I see. And we'll do similarly to what we did for the media center, where we'll be visiting other schools where there are um, similar spaces. I had I had a comment and a question. Um, I know that it's difficult to come up with a slide of district accomplishments. But I would love, I think we're so much more than academic, athletic, finance. Um, particularly, I would love to see athletic and co-curriculars. You did mention that. But I think I, our co-curriculars. I have an entire presentation I'm on sure. district accomplishments. So it's always hard to figure out kind of what to, to toss in here. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Um, and what we can do is sprinkle some, some others. Of the, even if I just add, what I can do with this presentation before we post it is I can put some of those other slides in here because we, one of the things that we really do try to do on an ongoing basis is acknowledge uh, you know, all that the staff and the students have done. So in the opening convocation for staff, we have slides upon slides that list um, the honors. And maybe we can include those in here. Uh, you know, it's not like it takes extra time to, to, for people to flip through a couple of slides. So that's a good suggestion. I'll add those in. Um, and my question is, you mentioned, uh, and it just sparked a memory, um, when you were talking about the, perform the Performing Arts Center, you talked about replacing the um, stage lighting with LED lighting. And it reminded me that we had been talking about a overall conversion to LED lighting. That's part of the, isn't that part of Is the, that part of the? That would be part of that ESIP um, program, ESIP. Okay. Energy I was wondering, Savings Improvement Program. So I was just wondering what is in the ESIP, if that includes that so and what our time frame is for that. The ESIP, well, it's, uh, right now we have to, to put it out in RFP. I think that's one of the things on the agenda to get some, get a company called an ESCO, which is an energy savings company that works hand in hand with the architects. So they kind of run it. So what they'll do is, the first thing they'll do is they'll come in here and do a very, very, very detailed audit. Uh, we've already had a state audit done where they came in here and looked at projects we could do. Um, there's a number of things that were recommended, but they were kind of cursory. Right. This, this ESCO will come in and they will look, they'll do a deeper dive. Um, just some of the things I will tell you that they, they put on the list. The lighting is always a big one because the, the turnaround investment there is, is is it's only a couple of years so you can do a project like that and it's gonna it's gonna help you do other projects we would love to do um, if we can some of the rooftop units like the one that's over our heads right now or no I mean mm -hmm. not this one this one's gonna be part of the media center but there's one over there there's one down there that they're very old and we'd like to get them in they may be cost prohibitive so I may not be able to put them in the ESIP. Um, but those are things we'd like to do. We'd like to do a little more controls with our, our heating and ventilating, mm -hmm. um, because some of the controls are a little older and antiquated. And it, sometimes if you, you're standing here and then you walk over in the south building, there's like a five degree temper, temperature difference. The kids mm -hmm. will tell you that. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they know where it's warm. They it's always hang out with systems throughout the building. So, um, so those are some things we'd like to do. Um, solar is another one. Mm -hmm. um, that would be on this north uh, roof here. Um, it's, to me, it would be perfect for it. 
But those are, that, that's what the ESCO is going to decide. That's the D3, right, where you're saying we're Correct. going to send out a request for proposals. For the ESCO, mm -hmm. yes. And what they do is they do that deep dive and they'll come up with these, these things. But that, it's in that kind of realm. It's all energy stuff. But so does the deep dive happen in one year and then the actual the deep, construction the deep, or, or? No, the deep, dive will, it, the deep dive will probably, uh, it's going to take three or four months for them to do that. Um, it's not simple because they got to get into every little unit, everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to take them a bit. And then they'll start, you know, they, then they have to contract with contractors. They're essentially the contractor. They're, they're like the general contractor right. in this process. Um, but yeah, the, from what they were telling me, by next year, they'll be putting in some of the lighting. Okay. And they could do it after hours, they could do it on weekends, that sort of thing. It depends on what we put in the bid. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, one comment and a question. Uh, regarding, I was pleased to see the administrative cost uh, shift over the one slot. Um, I would be curious to see how, how we sit when we look at all of the regional, uh, you know, kind of the 912s in the state, just to see where we're sitting with those costs. And the same thing with co-curricular, and I'm not sure why, but it seems like we're always, yeah. it appears that we're always on the low end of co-curricular spending, and I don't, I, I, I don't want to make a judgment based on that. I'm just kind of, kind of curious as to why that is, is and it, does it really mean that we're not investing as others are, or is, it, is there some other factor that makes it appear that way? So I think that's worth, and again, I'd like to see how we compare with the 47 regional districts in the state. Yeah, the, um, the, the state, that state website does have all of that. Um, I could give that to the board. We have, there's a, um, a state website that has, the, it's called Taxpayer's Guide to yeah. such and such, and has all, I can give you all the information. Uh, it does compare us to all those districts. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll see, we'll probably, I mean, administrative costs, I could tell you, we're on the higher side of that. And then on the co-curricular, we are, again, on the lower. It's a little better than this presentation um, when it comes to co-curricular, I can tell you that, uh, because you'll, you could see that there's other schools that, that are larger, um, so they have more students, so those numbers are going to skew a little bit for them. Uh, some of them, like just regionals, I believe, that have multiple schools, right? This uh, Freehold has three yep. schools. Yeah, so that's, that's going to skew the That's numbers. a different district, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But that, I think that's part of that number. So I, I'll, I mean, I could share that to the board. But if, I'll give you the website, too, if you want to look, because there's a lot of information on that. They have um, administrative, number of administrators per student, number of teachers per student. So there's a lot of stuff you can dig into on that stuff if you're really interested. And then uh, my other uh, just clarifying question uh, is based on the, the, uh, uh, the, the tax levy uh, that's been laid out here and the 1.2% the that we're going for, uh, this would be the second year in a row that we're going below cap. Is that correct? Correct. And, and as a result, that in essence means that some of the funds that we've received from the state uh, instead of using it ourselves, we're using that to, in essence, return to the taxpayer by not going to 2%. Is that correct? correct? Yeah, correct. So what we did, Bob, so when we got the $200,000 extras, so we took 100000 and put it into cap reserve, and we decided we should put $100,000 back to the taxpayer is what we did. Great. Thank you. But the state gave us the money. Did they give some, con with some conditions that money has to be spent this way or that way? The state aid? The state aid does it from some students at that? No, only, only debt service aid is, you can only use that in that debt service fund, that's okay. it. The, but the other aid, no, that, that's just general aid mm -hmm. for anything. Tim, uh, Naresh that's asked a question summary. during your presentation <laughs> about the uh, a possible uh, typo. Was he referring to the second line of the tax impact? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But that's not a percentage. That is a number. Yeah, I think, that's I the think tax that is. Rate. It's, not, it's not incorrect. Yeah, I, I was a little confused when you asked me that. I, I didn't know what you were looking at. <laughs> so, but so, yeah, the tax, uh, I put the wording made it ex 
confusing. Tax rate increase almost sounds that's, like a percentage. That's cent, cents per hundred. But it's cents per hundred dollars as well. Evaluation. Well, cents per hundred. That, that so we can we, we might want to add that to the slide and, as and what that, that means. That I may want to change that word. No, it's not. There. It's not a percentage. It's, a percentage. it's, it's how percentage. it's how many cents per hundred thousand dollars for hundred dollars of valuation your right. house is. Yeah, I, I think when I when I wrote it, 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 it looks like a percentage, and then it comes out of that, but. It's, yeah. But it, it's actually. I'll change the numbers around. Usually, the the newspaper guys always ask me for. Can you give me that for a hundred thousand dollar household? Am I right, Alex? No, no, it's not. No, per hundred dollars. No, it's not hundred thousand. It has to be hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. Then there's the yeah. percentage. Yeah. No, it's not. Percentage. It's not a percentage. That's a penny. It's, it's a penny. Uh, yeah. Two pennies. Peter, did you have anything else? Yeah, my other question with this additional money in state aid, did you get into this budget the money for the buzzer at the entrance to the board office? <laughs> no it wasn't a buzzer, <laughs> it was a pass. Uh, well, well, we'll get you in the door, <laughs> one way or another. You, you better get it in the budget before you present it the next time. So get one of those things or we're like going to need, airport, we're gonna know, need swipe passes. It's the Chris Memorial Swipe Pass. Jordana. So a couple questions. One is obviously we're in the midst of our strategic plan and you know, we're gonna be writing the initiatives mm -hmm. that deliver that plan. Do you and you know, we can't budgeting know for them? Are. Yes. Do we feel we have enough wiggle room to do the right thing to execute the plan? Should new thoughts and ideas come up that we're not aware of today? I think that the way we've approached it in the past um, with the last one, any of, you know, the, the Media Center project is an outgrowth of the strategic plan, and we're doing that in year five of the, the plan as opposed to year one because we knew we needed to budget for that. So when we are prioritizing the initiatives and planning them out, um, that certainly factors into it. Um, but, you know, sometimes what happens there are some of the, the instructional items that we are, you know, a, that we have in the budget for next year, that may shift a little bit based on some of the strategic plan work, um, but there certainly won't be all of, you know, these um, huge new purchases or additions into the budget for next year um, based on the strategic plan work this year just because it's not feasible. But the things that we want to do uh, more urgently than others, you know, we would basically be planning those for the 21-22 the, uh, school year yeah. um, and for that budget next year. So, you know, so I think it's fair to say that if there's some um, very large project that comes out of these strategic plan discussions, that it wouldn't be, likely would be something that would not be feasible for next year, um, but that we would be planning uh, in next year's budget for the following year. And then my second question is, you know, love to see it come under cap, who doesn't as a taxpayer, but the question is, do we feel that we've incorporated everything we feel we need to give, you know, the best education for our students and woohoo, we come under the cap, or do we feel there are other things that are not included in the budget that we should be surfacing and discussing and perhaps improving, should there be room, right? No, I, listen, I, I, this, we spent a lot of time with the administration on, on what they were looking for. Okay. Um, would we love to have more and more and more stuff? Uh, sure. Um, but listen, we, this is a very solid budget. What, you're, what we're getting in here, I mean, you know, and I can't, I won't speak for Anthony, he's new, <laughs> but uh, you know, we have a decent amount of tech in this budget uh, and we're accomplishing a lot. Um, that's awesome. Fair to say? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, some of the capital things we have in here are projects that we have put off and we're able mm -hmm. to do them now. Um, you know, it, if I could put more money in capital reserve, I yeah. would. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, you know, we would like to present a budget and then maybe in a year or two, if we can, mm -hmm. uh, go back out to some sort of referendum, yes. almost like the one we've done now. Mm -hmm. And there is a point in time when the voters say, you know what, enough. <laughs> so I, I think the board and I, and I, and I think us administratively are very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to overplay our hand, I guess, is kind of, you know. I think the other piece that plays into that too is we try to, to be very mindful of what we have the capacity to accomplish in a year. Um, so that whatever we're doing, we want to make sure we're doing it really, really well. 
um, which you know is why even let's say we had the money for the steam lab and the media center to do at the same time it would not that would not have been a, a good choice on our part because the the media center renovation i mean we have spent so much time on that because we want to make sure that we do it right the first time i've heard some myths about some prior construction projects that still tend to come up. So we're trying to not repeat the mistakes of the past. And if we make any, that they're at least new mistakes. Um, so so we really, so I think that's another piece that goes into it where, you know, are there things, are there other things on our list that we would like to do? Yes, um, but in terms of trying to prioritize and make sure that our focus is on what we feel are the most urgent priorities, um, we wanna be very mindful of that. Rita? Yes. Could I add, Jordana, two, two things? One, to your question uh, about, you know, things that come up in the strategic plan, you're still relatively new to the board. One of the things our business administrator does exceedingly well is have places in the budget where if there are that's needs for things to come up. I know budgets. And, and so that, that's one of the reasons we're often at the end of the year able to yeah. add substantial amounts to capital reserve. But in past years, when there's been a need for a new program or something, you know, the board makes a decision and Tim usually finds a way to come up with that money. The second thing I'll say is at the operations committee meeting before the last week, and we had a fairly robust discussion about this concept of not going for the full 2% that we could go for. We, the, the members of the operations committee felt at the time that this was the right balance because we were putting in a very substantial $500,000 in, into capital reserve. Now with the extra state aid, uh, we can give back even more tax relief and still get over $800,000 into capital reserve. That's a healthy piece. It's, it's not everything, but it's a healthy piece of what we project. You know, two or three years of that, we'll have our portion of a steam lab. Base, basically, or if and so, something, if the, or if there's a whole or something other, else right. that, that, that the board <laughs> may decide on between now and and then, but it, it's it's a balancing, and sure. uh, th that's what we, the members of the operations mm -hmm. committee felt we should try to do as well. Okay, anybody? Barry, ready? Questions? Question? I just have one. Do we have dates for when you're going to go s to the towns? Oh, good question. We have. Well, we'll that'll so, that, that'll yeah, be next so, on our. So what happens too. next is that now at our next meeting you vote on this budget. Now, um, then it goes to the county and. You know, if there's, don't forget, there, there could be changes from Bless Bless you. Bless you. from wash those hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm conditioned now. It's like, anyway, so um, Pavlovian response. <laughs> so uh, no, so we go to the. Um, now I'm, I lost my train of thought. Now. So <laughs> we go to the county. We go to the there county. in between the 17th and the. Yeah. So things can Once change. The county approves, right. Then things we can, go things to the can change. Right. Okay. So in between our next board meeting and April 28th, we mm -hmm. generally go to three townships. Um, we do usually ask to go to Greensboro County. We do. They haven't really wanted. Uh, well, I don't say they wanted us there. They have other things going on, I guess. So, <laughs> but anyway, so we do go to three towns in between. Um, and we will get dates for you. Okay. Yeah, we'll certainly let you know. Really? Yeah, you want to come Very to the Long Hill one. They'll be, they'll be like rolling out the red carpet for yeah. Long Hill. <laughs> um, I will, I will, one, one other comment I would make is that the strategic plan and, and the role it plays in our budget development, I can't overemphasize that enough and how it helps us administratively uh, prepare a budget. We, you know, we can focus in on what the districts, the boards, the administration's needs are, and it comes to life through this vehicle. There's no doubt this has been a huge change and help for us. Um, because in the past, you know, you, I would, things would come at us from different angles. Oh, we need this, this special interest, this and that. And we can kind of push that aside to say, look, this is our strategic plan. We'd like to get to that, but this is our plan. And when we have time, we will and resources, but this is our plan. And that is a tremendous help. It's, it's really helped us focus on, on our mission here. And I think that's, I, I thank the board and the administration for that. Thank you. Thank and you. If I could just add, and it's a big difference be, before the strategic plan, the last five years, before that, when each year the board would have goals that would change each year, 
there would be enough change in those goals that you wouldn't have a long-term direction to the budget. And it really has not just stabilized, but it's focused our budgeting much more in the last five years that I've been here. So I just want to echo what Tim said. It, it's, I found it one of the biggest benefits of the strategic plan is the way it translates into how we budget. Okay. So let's move into committee reports, the education report. The education committee uh, met on February 25th, 2020, last week, uh, last Tuesday, uh, and there were a handful of items that we covered. Uh, the first was uh, Dr. Jewett provided us with an update on discussions with the sending districts regarding math articulation. We've been talking about ways that we can um, uh, work with our sending districts to try to make sure that uh, instruction is aligned in some key areas. Uh, so the superintendent had a meeting with the regional superintendents and their curriculum directors, and they're all committed to moving forward on a strategy to really look at what is the math instruction, particularly at the middle school level, um, to see how things may be aligned, to review the practices, and they're utilizing uh, a, a company that creates um, uh, what they call Ed Reports. And Ed Reports goes through to make sure that the texts that you're using or the curriculum that you are using is actually in alignment with the standards themselves and the assessment. So that, you know, there's a lot of curricular materials and books that are out there that say that they're aligned that aren't. And so unless somebody's done the research and analysis to ensure that everything is you know, in alignment all the way through from the standards to the curriculum to the assessment itself, um, you can find yourself that, that um, the students aren't doing as well as they could be because the <coughs> curriculum's not in alignment with what's happening uh, to the degree that they're gonna be assessed. So, um, they're working with Ed Reports, and I believe also with Dr. Barry Ehrlichson. Is she going to be working? I don't believe she's going to be. She was the one who helped connect us with Ed Reports, so I don't think she'll be directly involved with the consultants from Ed Reports. And, right. and in addition to the, it's the, really the middle school math up through. We're trying to look at a sixth grade math through Algebra Two articulation. Yeah. So uh, they're looking at uh, professional development and uh, also uh, ways to. Uh, find the appropriate resources to bring them into alignment. So, Liz, is there anything else you wanted to comment no, that's on? Good. That? Thank you. Um, we also had a discussion around the, the diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives for the district. Uh, there's been a series of professional development. Um, Ms. Phelan uh, was in the meeting and provided an overview of the training. They've had three different sessions that have uh, taken place. Uh, which is part of the component of the current strategic plan. They're specifically looking at um, issues around ethnicity, personal identity, and race. Uh, they have a fourth session that will be coming up uh, sometime in March that will be focused on gender. Um, the second part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion uh, was regarding the graduation regalia. Uh, and mm -hmm. Principal Labrera joined us to talk about a discussion uh, regarding the fact that our current regalia is assigned based on gender. Uh, our females wear white, our males wear gold. Uh, they were looking to move towards a more unified gown for all graduating seniors as they investigated designs and everything else that could be accomplished you know, in time for this graduation what they were being presented with just didn't make any sense. Uh, there was just no way to, to find a viable solution for a new unified gown uh, in time for this graduation. So the administration has been looking at uh, some other options. Uh, and so where they have uh, kind of landed, I don't know if you've, if, if it's a you can. We're going to be sending out notification to the parents upcoming, but Bob, feel free to, so the, to leak it now. But, <laughs> so the, what they're going to do for this year is that the parents and students will be able to pick the color that they choose to wear for this year. So it's all driven by student choice and parental choice. You know, whatever color between white and gold that they want to wear, they can wear it. It doesn't matter what it looks like on the field because they're all mixed anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, so that way, um, the choice is now the students. We're not imposing that decision on them. And then over the, over the next several months, they're going to be looking 
for a vendor and some designs that will be implemented for next year. Mm -hmm. And obviously one of the concerns is senior pictures take place over the course of the summer. So they're trying to have some things in, in, in place in time for that, uh, but certainly in time for graduation in 2021. Thank you. And so just to, to clarify um, to, or to add on to that, um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so a, a notification will be going out to the parents just to let them know that um, it, it'll, it will be in the next couple of weeks um, that if they want to switch the, you know, that this, if the student or the parent wants to switch the color, uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to communicate it in the least confusing way so that um, obviously female students as of now, as it's always been in the past, are well, they would be ordered a white gown and the male students would be ordered a yellow gown. We'll let the parents know that if, if this, their student wants to change that, um, that they have the ability to do so. Uh, we talked to the to the gown distributor about when we need to notify them of that for. Uh, but there will be two colors, that, but, right? There I'm will, sorry? There will be only two colors, right? No. There will be two color options. For now. Yes. Yes. And so for this year, options. we're just going to allow them to choose, and then we will um, make a change for next year. But so these are rented, rented, right? These gowns are rented. You um, they are what? No, they're, they're rented. rented. No, they're the purchased. Oh, they're okay. they're not heavy, expensive gowns. Yeah, I believe it's it's in the 20s, the price range for the gowns. So we're looking for something a little bit nicer that perhaps incorporates both colors for the future. Anybody want to buy a white one? <laughs> I still have a white one if anyone wants. I've got a white and gold one. So. <laughs> I've got three blues in <laughs> So the, um, the last item was uh, we had a, a discussion regarding the athletics and co-curriculars and how we make determinations on spending regarding uh, uh, trips for both athletics and co-curricular clubs. Uh, Mr. Size is looking into you know, our practices and looking at what the practices are at some other schools. Uh, he's going to be pulling that information together for a, a, an ongoing discussion that we'll have at the next Education Committee meeting, and we'll continue to update the board based on that work. Just so I'm clear, when we say math articulation, we're talking about that the timing and the sequence of the curriculum as it's presented is the same in all the sending districts? Is that what we're kind of talking about? We're looking at um, what we're... What we've, what, what research has uncovered um, and what the, the consultants, you know, spoke to is that the curriculum that you have on paper generally, uh, you know, it, it, it matches the standards. Right. Um, however, the implementation of it in the classroom may not be achieving the, the um, math practice standards because the resources are not as aligned to the curriculum and the standards as they should be, even though the publishers claim they are. So it's not just like, I'm learning this area of math, but I'm learning it maybe in seventh grade instead of eighth grade, so by the time I get to ninth grade, I forgot it. It's really more <laughs> the implementation of the math practice standards, okay. and, and specifically at the, um, the level of math courses for our most struggling learners, so the students who may not be getting to algebra until high school. And, and so it, there, there are a couple of things interwoven and they're part of it certainly will be the articulation to make sure that it's sequenced appropriately from mm -hmm. sixth grade um, you mm -hmm. know, through algebra two. But a big piece, and, and I, you know, I call it the low hanging fruit or the resources because that is a tangible thing that the teachers can all look at. And 10 years ago, having this conversation would have been frustrating because the resources were not just they weren't great you didn't have a lot of great resources to choose from and so if you wanted to do an effective job in your classroom you really had to supplement them with a lot of other resources and that can be effective however from it's it's very difficult from a student perspective when you don't have a core resource to go to you know the teacher may know okay i'm pulling from here i'm pulling from here i'm pulling from mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. but when the the student needs additional practice or instruction mm -hmm. or reinforcement and they have 20 different resources that things may have come from it makes it much mm -hmm. harder from the student perspective mm -hmm. so that's why looking at the resources and how those are used to support the implementation of the math practice standards um, especially, you know, for our most struggling learners, we think that um, the research shows that that makes a big difference. So that's okay. where we're looking at. And this we're starting time. with math, but certainly our, our articulation goals will be beyond. Math. Well, and the reason we're starting with math is that this seems to be um, the the place where we struggle the most. We we have done we have made tremendous progress in articulation in, um, with the 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 K eight districts in all subject areas. The the challenge with math is that. You know, every student in other subject areas, every student comes into the high school taking ninth grade English. Every student comes into the high school taking world history as a freshman. 
you can come into math and be taking one of five different courses, five, five different content areas for math. Um, so I could be misspeaking, but I know it's at least, I believe it's at least four, um, I, but I think it might even be five or six. So when you're coming from four different districts into ninth grade, where you may be in four, one of four to five different levels of math, and when I say levels, I mean courses. I don't mean CPA or honors. I mean math courses, be it geometry, mm -hmm. algebra, algebra one, um, algebra two, pre-calculus. Um, there, it, it makes it much more difficult to make sure that all the students are coming into ninth grade with the foundation that they need for those classes. So that's why math, and, and that is something that I found in talking to my regional counterparts, all regional, even non-regional high school districts have difficulty with that transition um, from eighth to ninth grade for math, but specifically regional, regional high schools have that challenge. Um, so that is, is one of the reasons that that's our, our main area of focus, because that is where we struggle the most with that transition. And it's my recollection that one of the things that, that led us there was looking at the at the state scores each year and, and not mm -hmm. not performing where we thought we should be performing with mm -hmm. that that level of math on those state tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that was a very helpful indicator and piece of data. Personnel, is there any? Oh, yep. Thanks. So the personnel committee met on February twenty fifth. We received an update on the, a status update on the search for a director of special services. Uh, we, the, the, the interview committee has completed its round of interviews, uh, I believe interviewing four candidates, and they're confident that they will have a candidate for board approval in April. We also, um, we are re-reviewing our policy on our use, possession, and, or distribution of substances. We had talked about this at our last meeting, and we were incorporating some language uh, due to recent regulation changes uh, having to do with employee, employee consent to medical examination. But um, under discussion was whether we should incorporate a last chance agreement. And so we re-reviewed the policy uh, to look to adding that and decided that we, were, we should have uh, council advice on that. So we referred that to council and the suggestion, can I say that, came back that we not include a last chance agreement in the policy, that we could offer a last chance agreement if we ever felt it was appropriate. So we're going to be re-reviewing that policy and that will be on our um, April, April first, first reading will be in April. I believe so. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Um, and then secondly, and then what, do you want to ask a question? Just a point of clarification. What does last chance mean? What, it, is, it, what is it that you're referring to? It, uh, it means not terminating. Is that if it is? Beth, you can probably speak yeah. to more detail. If, if we had an employee who was um, either actually tested positive under the influence while at work or supervising a co-curricular after school activity or refused tr uh, to be tested and then it's treated as, as a positive result. So then there's an optional paragraph in the policy of the board offering a last chance agreement as opposed to heading towards uh, tenure charges for that employee. It's optional language. Um, not including that language doesn't preclude the board if they felt the circumstances were appropriate to go ahead and offer that last chance agreement. But with absent of having that optional language, there's not a, an expectation that every employee who was under that circumstance would be offered a last chance agreement. Thank you. And then finally, we reviewed the action and preview uh, items on tonight's agenda. One of the preview items is a revision of two job descriptions for two supervisor jobs. Um, it, it's to align our job descriptions with what the actual supervisors supervise. Um, a year ago, we made a change and uh, removed from, uh, it used to be the supervisor of arts, uh, arts, health and phys ed and co-curricular, and we had moved the health and phys ed, excuse me, a year ago we had a supervisor of arts, co-curricular, health and phys ed, and we had a supervisor of world languages. A year ago we took the health and phys ed piece 
and moved it to the supervisor of world languages. And so we have revised the job descriptions for those two supervisory positions. Those, that's a preview of item tonight. Okay. Any questions? Operations, is there anything other than the budget? Uh, <laughs> just a couple things. Uh, one thing primarily, Tim, Tim advised us at the last meeting uh, that uh, we've been, uh, we're getting back a credit of approximately $61,000 from our custodial service that is a result of uh, uh, Chris, Chris Beck and his staff keeping close tabs on the people who actually check in and check out from the custodial service to, to do the work. Uh, and then and they went back and sat down with the custodial service and pointed out where they didn't meet, meet the requirements of the contract that they had signed. Uh, and that's what's resulting in a $61,000 credit, which is approximately the cost of one month of service under a custodial contract. Uh, there was a discussion that if we held them to the exact letter of the contract, that figure might go up a little higher, but that also would probably involve us having to, uh, to engage in legal action to try and get them to a higher number. <laughs> Therefore, the committee felt that, that settling for, for that number was the, the best way to go, with thanks to uh, both Chris Bick and his staff and to Tim and his staff for uh, you know watch, watching the pennies and watching what should have been done and taking action. Uh, other than that, there was a brief discussion concerning the budget and the uh, possibility of uh, of a way for people not to have to get up to let people come in <laughs> the board office door, uh, which Chris Bick offered an alternative that uh, may have to be discussed. That was unanimously approved by the operations <laughs> committee. <laughs> <laughs> they don't write that in your paper. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago, there had been an issue regarding uh, uh, board board members who like to come and swoop into the building and and, and confront teachers, administrators, and, and other people, and uh, and that's one of the reasons we're all asked to, to come in and, and report to the superintendent or the board or the board office when we come to the building. It's for security purposes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so we now have our first opportunity for public comment. Um, comment period will be limited to agenda items for this meeting only. The second public comment period will be open to any topic. All comments are limited to five minutes. Okay, seeing none, I'll close the first opportunity for public comment. Um, and we have board discussion on first the agenda items. Or actually, we could do future and agenda items all together. That doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> So does anybody have any questions or want to have any discussions about the agenda items for tonight or the future action items uh, for next? Can I actually ask a clarifying question about what we have under board discussion? Because so when, and That's I know I created this. It. Yes, I just want to know when we, <laughs> say, not when we say future discussion items, I don't know if we, and I just don't remember the intent when we change it to this. Did we mean if anyone had any items for future board discussion? No, that, that would be new, new stuff at the end. When I, they, think, or I think that's we, what we originally I meant. I think that was our but intention. But for the last two years when We've I was president, I had no idea what these two <laughs> were. So I think it's really, um, yeah. it really is our future agenda items and then our action no, and our agenda business. items is yes. really how, how we've interpreting it. So maybe ah. I should, future so, right. so we, yeah. maybe future we'll change that on here so it's not as confusing. So I think we put future right. discussion right. items on there. It's just as an opportunity Everything in case anyone but had still in the agenda. an item they wanted yeah. on for, for future, future discussion, discussion. like it's the board retreat or the street, something like yes. that. Uh, but people do that anyway, so I don't know that we need that on here. Oh, okay, I always thought that came under other business. Yeah. So, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> which is fine. I just, yeah. I'll change it to make it a little less confusing so that, and it should actually be reordered into discussion items and then like, uh, you know, future agenda items and agenda items, something yeah. like that. Agenda. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anyway, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Agenda, agenda questions? Go ahead. Uh, again, just a point of clarification. So the, the calendar is uh, up for this evening? Uh, just for, no, it's a preview item this evening. Okay. So, um, and you have a copy 
a paper copy in your folder, please, I ask that you don't take this with you. I am so protective of copies of these calendars just because I don't like them being out anywhere. I already posted it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you just post it out, right? Um, until it's approved. Um, but I did share it with the association and reviewed it with them. It mimics our calendar uh, for next year um, where we have the staff coming in uh, those first two days uh, that week prior to Labor Day. Um, the holidays fall a little bit differently next year, so you can see that the students are in for three days, and then we have Labor Day off, and then the following day uh, yeah. is Rosh Hashanah. <coughs> so those first two weeks of school are abbreviated. The one thing that may come up uh, in the next month or so on this calendar and um, on, on the 2021 calendar in the contract, it indicates that the first day of school is a half day. Um, and what we have done the past couple of years is we've done a sidebar where we swap that day with the day before the, hol the winter holiday break so mm. that the first day of school is a full day and then December 23rd is a half day. Um, however, because I'm following the contract with this, I, every year when I put the calendar initially forward, I put the first day of school as a half day and ask the association if they want to, to um, approve the same sidebar. So I do believe that they were going, so I may be asking you, I may, that may be one adjustment I make on this, and I may also be asking you to make an adjustment on the coming year's calendar just to make that first day of school a full day. Um, but that's why on here it says, it says half day, even though we've adjusted that every year. But this calendar looks exactly the same as the, the 2021 calendar in terms of the holidays. Spring break is, got, it's more than a week, is that? It's more, it's so, what I try to do each year with spring break is overlap the, the week um, that we give off that's related to Easter with the week we give off related to Passover, so that it overlaps with Passover. So generally, it's the, it, the past couple of years, Passover has fall, fallen the week before Easter. Um, during this year, it happens to fall the week after, so it's Good Friday and the following week. That's how that falls. But we try to coordinate them so that they overlap. But our um, winter break is a little shorter, so that helps a little bit. Any other questions on agenda or future discussion items? Um, Madam President, I do have one thing that I do want to touch base on. Sure. Uh, on, it's under the future agenda items number 19 it's, it's some technology items d19 uh yeah d19 but the future right. yeah yeah so one of the things that um i've tasked for anthony here with um you may have heard some stories you heard certainly heard livingston uh, but i think there's other oh, schools yeah. that have been hit with uh cyber security attacks and those kind of things um, so we're you know to that end we're trying to implement things in house uh, but we're also doing some things with the hardware to help uh, one is a bid that we have today we had today that we're kind of looking at right now with Meraki, um network uh, switches nancy you gotta help me out with these things but anyway so so that that's part of that so i i think this is part of that or this is kind of redundancy but maybe you can explain that to them just so they understand that because it's a lot for me to Explain. <laughs> I'll do my best without getting too technical. Uh, so our um, infrastructure servers are virtualized and they live in a cluster of three servers or three nodes. Uh, right now we have no failover capability. Um, they're fine. Uh, they are backed up. But if one server should have a hardware issue, it won't be able to fail over to another node. So uh, we're requesting, hopefully with your support, a purchase of a fourth node that will help us stay up and running in case we experience a hardware failure in that area. It's also good for security purposes that it allows us to do some things later on that I plan to implement here that may involve some cloud backup and under uh, replication between multiple servers. So if something should happen to one machine, we have another machine that will run at the same time. So redundancy is the goal here. So, for example, if one server was your email server and the email server went down, it, would, it wouldn't go down because it would go over to something else? Well, uh, we don't have an email server. Well, but everything's like, Google, but yes. Uh, I'll give you a file server. To. Let's go with a file server right okay. now. Our, one of our file servers go down, uh, staff would not have access to their files. Okay. Uh, with this redundancy, it gives us more room and space to bring up another server, which will replicate with each other. So if one server needs to go down for maintenance or there's a hardware issue on that node, 
it's, because it's virtualized, it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to explain this, mm -hmm. but if there's a hardware issue there, it allows the second server to keep running. It's distributed file systems, essentially. That's what it does. Credit card companies work this way. You know, when you're in Chicago, you ring your credit card, but the, the database is in New York. How does it know your bank account in Chicago? It kind of replicates around the country. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> scary. So what about uh, any, I mean, what are the reasons for selecting SHI International? About this company, I never heard about this. Oh, uh, yeah, this is a local vendor. I think they're in Somerset. Yeah, they're here. Uh, they're, um, we've been dealing with them. They have co-op uh, agreements uh, and their preferred Lenovo vendor. Uh, we've used them before to buy that infrastructure piece. Uh, we also use them for our laptops and some other equipment that we've had here. So in they're the, the supplier. They don't they're the supplier. They're the, the, they're the vendor that, that communicates with Lenovo for uh, um, pricing and then provides us a price. But which, which company makes them? Cisco or Juniper? Le L Lenovo. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, it's so learning over hardware. I see. Um, yeah. And the price, I mean. Oh yeah, it's uh, using the Tonix, which mm -hmm. is the management piece that's part of the manages that cluster of servers. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Fair. A lot of the, uh, especially the top-notch cloud backups, uh, since you're using VMware, they allow you to spin up a VMware server within 30 seconds. Yes. So. You say, okay, this node's down, boom, next one launches, and you're back in the line before mm. you know it's down. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's, I'm assuming that's what Yeah, the Natonix piece there, it manages to three, yeah. hopefully four. If something should happen to one of the nodes, it automatically moves Kicks it over to the fourth node. You don't even notice anything. It just does it automatically. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks Thank you. <laughs> okay. So why don't we move to our agenda items. Page. Action items. Action items. items. Yeah, action items. Right. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to move items A1 through A4. Second. Any questions or comments on A1 through A4? Hearing none. Dr. Chan? Yes. Mr. Fallon? Yes. Mr. Hayek? Yes. Mr. Hunsinger? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mrs. Over? Yes. Potter? Yes. Dr. Shabilsky? Yes. Ms. Rabon? Yes. And Ms. Burrow? I'm going to abstain from A1 and A2. Yes to A3 and A4. Okay. Motion's carried. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to move item A5. Second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none. Uh, Dr. Chan? Yes. Mr. Fallon? Yes. Mr. Hayek? Yes. Mr. Hunsinger? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Over? Yes. Dr. Shabilsky? Yes. Ms. Rabon? Yes. And Ms. Burrow? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to move item C1 through C4. Second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none. Dr. Chan? Yes. Mr. Fallon? Yes. Mr. Hayek? Yes. Mr. Hunsinger? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Dover? Yes. Mr. Potter? Yes. Dr. Shabilsky? Yes. Ms. Rabon? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Motion carries. And Madam President, I'd like to move items D1 through D5. Second. Any questions or comments? So I have one question. Um, this is good finance. I, sorry, I don't see it right now where it is. But I saw that uh, you require approval to allocate $1,500 for travel grant for each person. Does that include all the teachers or just select few people? Or what is this for? Which one? Yeah, it looks like D4. That. I don't know where it is right now because I read it. Uh, is it the mini tab? Uh, I don't know where it is. It said that. Um, no, it, I that, think it's the preview item. That's uh, future action. Yeah. Future action. I see. Okay. Okay. Which one is this? He's looking at the fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a policy issue. Okay, that's that's a policy yeah. issue. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, Dr. Chan? Yes. Mr. Fallon? Yes. Mr. Hayek? Yes. Mr. Hunsinger? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mrs. O Mrs. Yep. Ober? Yes. Ms. Potter? Yes. Dr. Shabilsky? Yes. Ms. Rabon? Yes. And Ms. Brown? Yes. Oh, Ms. Carrick. Okay. Uh, this is now the second opportunity for public fund comment. Okay. Seeing none. Other business? Uh, and just a, a point of clarification, could you uh, uh, repeat what your comment was regarding the, the uh, 
uh, Regional. regionalization discussions. Yeah, we're continually we're continuing to communicate with the K through eights to see if they were willing to go with it go with us into the grant. Um, in the meantime, we're going to get uh, DOE information pertaining to the tax impact, like preliminary information. The DOE can actually kind of give us those numbers without doing a full study, just on the tax impact to to get that information, um, so that we can continue to have the conversation. Obviously, the conversation is just not tax impact. It's about articulation, mm -hmm. about all these other things. Um, but we're just the. The communication is ongoing. There hasn't been a decision where all the K through rates have said yes or no at this point. Yeah, it's, I'm just I'm intrigued on how they do a tax impact evaluation if you don't know what the they what what a configuration is ultimately going to look like. And they, the state's very clear because part, so and we actually need that information in order to apply for the grant. My oh, one great. of my frustrations okay. with the grant is. In order to apply for it, it seems from what I've read, a lot of the application requires us to start the feasibility study to get some of the information that they're asking for, um, because they actually ask in the grant application for how, what cost savings do you see? Well, that's why we need to do the feasibility study. Um, but they do ask for some of this data, and so Roger Jinks, the county suit, yeah. when he, he knew that we were um, looking at the grant, had mentioned to me that he can go ahead and notify the state that we're looking for that information. Now, what they do, Though in that calculation is they just assume that the tax levy will be all of the tax levies combined. And then what they do is they, um, similar to how Tim was presenting, how they figure out the formula based on um, the enrollment and the valuation of the homes, they'll use that to then figure out what the, the um, tax allocation will be for each of the four towns. Oh, okay. Does I got it, it. Got it? Got it. Are they including Greenbrook in that? Yes. Yes. They. So mm -hmm. they're coming up with a new contract? And I, well, and, and actually, um, what I did ask them if they can <laughs> do quite. as well, because this has come up before, and Bruce had brought this up, um, is if Greenbrook were to become a constituent district right. rather yeah. than a send receive, yeah. I also asked them if they can calculate what how that would affect the, the um, tax allocation. That one is a little trickier to yeah. do because they can't. The, Greenbrook pays us tuition, pays for their own transportation. So Tim and I, I Tim looked at my email before I sent it to Roger to send it to the state to make sure I had all that in there because we said, look, this isn't just a matter of adding up the tax levies right. and, and dividing it. You know, they we have to account for that tuition and how that would factor into our tax levy. Um, so, th but I did, we did send all. I sent that to Roger, who was yeah. sending that to the state, and they were in the midst of their budget craziness so they said it would take a little time but I do believe that's information we need to apply for the grant anyway so they're starting to work on it so that will be really good initial information to get for discussion uh, I also did reach out to the South Hunterdon uh, the former yeah, South Hunterdon superintendent yeah. um, who was there when they they went through the regionalization and um, and they shared with us their feasibility study and some other documents um, that I've been accumulating, um, and we can actually, I, I can put those in the board folder for anyone who's interested. At the same time, they're reading, you know, what Tim referred you to on the state website about uh, the, the um, fund balance and information. You know, if you really are having trouble falling asleep, you can yeah. read the feasibility studies. <laughs> um, but I had a great conversation with that superintendent. Um, and, you know, the one thing, the one comment that she, she did make is, if the, in that um, region, there they had their elementary districts were so so small that it, it was very very financially hard for them to to maintain those districts because they just couldn't afford to have the personnel that they needed to to oversee different things. Um, so they had really been looking at it for for a number of years. I think they might have even had one of the towns that didn't have an operating school district. Um, so she said that, you know, the big enticement there was that nobody was going to be a loser in terms of the tax allocation from the new district. And she said if that had been the case, the conversation would have been very different. Um, but because they essentially were all winners from the, the formation of that district, it made it a very different conversation. Uh, but she did share that information with us. So we're, we're starting to collect all of that. And if the, I, I can compile that into a folder in the board folder just for any board members who want to take a look yes. at that. That report was so. Thick. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of pages. And 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 just to clarify, when is the state doing a, an analysis based on the three, and then a, another analysis based on the four? Or are they just doing? <laughs> they're doing a K twelve as of right now. They're doing it as if we were a K twelve for all five districts five. together, 
And then if we stayed it with the same um, 912 regional high school structure, but Greenbrook were to become a constituent district rather than a, have a send receive relationship. Meaning that they're, te you know, like they're every town's their tax base. Right, right, yes. right. They're regionalized, but they're not, we're not yeah. part of one system. Exactly. Got mm -hmm. it. But just so everybody's clear that all of this takes a lot of political will. So yes. to get this moving, we're right. all going to kind of have to like talk to our constituent districts after we get that information to see if we can all even get together to do this grant because people don't like change, Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I, 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 <laughs> and one of the things that I think is interesting about the South Hunter and regionalization I mean, they were, were the last district that went mm -hmm. through a regionalization process, which was now about six or seven years ago. Uh, there was, and before that, it was another 15, 20 years mm -hmm. before there was, you know, an, another regionalization. But one of the things that they talk about is oftentimes a lot of people focus on what's the tax implication, what's the tax implication, who's going to benefit, you know, who, who are the winners and losers. Mm -hmm. But, and I don't know if she shared this with you, but one of the things that came out from their work was their, their tax benefit savings might have been marginal, right. but their education impact was oh, sure. significant. Mm -hmm. And just the improvement to the overall educational environment for the students made, mm -hmm. you know, that's why you do it. I mean, it, it's great if there's a tax benefit, and, and we certainly would want to have the due diligence. But the other, the bigger piece of this is how do we provide an even better educational environment for our students? And that, that's the reason you look to regionalize because any cost savings are not going to occur till years down the road when, rain, when, you know, and, I, and our, our K-8 <laughs> districts have already done a nice job of sharing services with special education programs where rather than all four of them trying to all have every program, they each have, you know, specialized so that they can send students to each other. Um, and, and so those are the types of savings that you see years down the road. But anyone who's expecting immediate savings to come from regionalization, it, it's not going to happen. Um, but the educational benefits, you know, are certainly there with, with articulation. And, and that being said, our, the boards of the K-8s and the administrators and, and us, I think, have, have made tremendous strides and really are very committed um, to acting as much like a unified district as we can, given the current structure. Um, so we've made tremendous strides with that. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously when you have five different districts, there are certain limits that you face. I suppose what you mentioned, the problem of transition of mathematics, right, from mm -hmm. middle school to high school, mm -hmm. that problem would dilute, I suppose. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be mm -hmm. the idea. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Tim, I have a question for you. And the new item. <laughs> you mentioned last time in the operation committee that um, that you were planning to buy a tool or get a tool for putting all the number, etc. You know, for the budget. Is the tool, tool. You, program? The program. Oh, a program for yeah, you, for, for the budget, the budget etc. You know, you were talking about no, what, that you don't have talking a tool about yet. The state budget program being released. Probably that. Yes, that, I think the, so. Probably the state budget software that it hadn't yeah. been opened up e yet. Each year, each year, the state gives us different budget mm -hmm. software. Right. And, and Tim can't fully put together everything until he gets mm -hmm. that from the state. It's so not something we go out and buy. No. It's something that they do. It's it, what I was actually. What I wait for. It's it's kind of like an edit check. So when you're putting in information in their software. It calls out any problems or mistakes <laughs> that they're looking for. I see. So when they review, so if you do run all your edit checks and you're okay, then you, I feel a little more confident that the numbers are good because I'm complying with what they want. That's what I was looking for. Okay. So, yes. So I have a little item. It's pouring outside anyway. We're not. Uh, <laughs> it just stopped. It just I think we should have dashed it now. Your, your time's well, I'm going to share. So I've had, you know, I've had thoughts marinating in my head these past few weeks, and I feel compelled to share them with you guys. It's a passion area of mine, and you inspired me last time with your passion of police, Susan. So um, um, hopefully it's not going to be too stream of consciousness. Um, but as you guys are aware, we're in an election year, and it's quite a historic time period, right? We got a bunch of billionaires running, we've got a socialist or socialist Democrat running, 
And so, you know, I tried to summon my, my sophomore to come sit with me, watch some of the debates, and the response I got from him is, I'm slammed with homework, I can't. And I'm like, well, don't you guys, you have US history, don't you guys discuss that in class? And he's like, nope, we don't talk about current events. So I thought, well, that just can't be. Maybe it's my robotics guy, or unless it has a drive shaft or something like that, maybe he's just not into it. So I started just talking to his friends, doing my little focus groups. <laughs> and I, I know the marketers, so I just do focus groups all the time. I learned that that is indeed the case, that we don't require students to watch the news, and we don't, as, and you know, again, from my little focus groups, discuss current events in the classroom environment. And I feel like, you know, as I think, as I marinate with strategic plan being top of mind, and I feel mm -hmm. like, hey, we want our students to be global citizens. Well, how can you be a global citizen if you don't know what's happening in your own backyard and you can't debate and discuss it? Um, how do we want to do, be critical thinkers, right? Something that's very important for us as well. And as I do my little focus groups and talk to students, the other thing that I learn is that in history classes, students are given a list of sources that are reputable sources that they could go into or, or you know, should turn to for, for their work. And the students themselves point out that those sources are very kind of one-sided and they see it. And so as I think about us wanting to raise critical thinkers, I'm thinking, well, should we be handing them a list of sources or should we be teaching them on how to critically think and choose and analyze why is one source better than the other? Should we be giving them two sources that are from opposite ends of the argument and asking them or requiring them to listen to both sides of the story and critically compare. So I just feel like, you know, I mean, we've got this amazing movement by the youth happening right now. You know, the greatest democracy of all is, has a movement towards socialism, social democracy, whatever you call it. I just feel like, um, you know, are we, pre are we preparing our students to critically assess the implications and understand the implications of what's going on and where our nation is moving? I mean, I don't know what percent of our senior year is turning 18 this year. They're going to be voting. Holy moly. Are we preparing them to make informed decisions? And I just worry that the answer is not to many of these things, and I would just like to challenge our curriculum and challenge our approach, especially as we have these in our you know, current strategic plan. And I hope being raising global citizens and critical thinkers does not go away, because to me, that's the foundation of education. And so how do we really deliver on those strategic goals? The one, thing is, the one thing is, <laughs> <laughs> the one thing is that, that civics, if you talk to the social studies supervisor, she'll tell you every single time she comes up here that she wants a civics course. But it's not, and it's, one, not, and it's one thing, thing in a civics course, I just think we feel have like that I, needs to be in a, well, I mean, we're, we have, what, two years? I'll follow up and history. find out, because I know they do a lot of work around the election, and they have a mock election, and... Um, so I will follow up just to see if that's an accurate portrayal of what's, yeah. or if that's just a, a certain students who happen to be in a particular track that have that experience. So that that's the first piece of this is I can and certainly get more information on that. Of that, that and again, that might be a, a, a particular teacher that approaches is that approaches yeah. it that way, um, because one of the things you know one of our goals is we need to teach them to be critical consumers of information. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I understand in middle school, I remember like, you know, look at these sites, or right, because we want to make sure, I mean, there's a lot of crap out there, sure. But at this point in high school, let them go and tell me why it's a crap. Okay. Explain, think, right? Take two, take CNN and Fox News for crying out loud. Listen to the same story in both of them and talk to me. What have you heard? How do you assess, right? I, I feel, to me, I feel like that should be part of our curriculum and have what we are requiring of any level, of any kid, because all of them are going to be voters. I don't care what track they're on. Yeah. Brittany, did you want to say 
you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, well, I think it's a worthwhile discussion to explore how if the more mainstream all students, but just to kind of defend the administration regard what I was. Oh, and I'm not. I, and, I, and I there's no defense needed. I'm not criticizing but anyone. Not trust criticizing. Me. Just uh, <laughs> providing more examples where you're yeah. talking about. Uh, we had Congressman Leonard Lance come for a town for students yep. uh, to mock election. Uh, we analyzed different sources. We had those fruitful discussions with people from different aisles. I remember being very vocal and having debates with other students. Um, you know, we have the JSA and the mock trial club where students are actively researching. So I personally, you know, I'm obsessed with politics and I followed. So if it's something we can explore about making and more mainstream. And making sure that, sure that all students obsessed. have yeah. that experience yeah. and yeah. that yeah. it's yeah. not dependent it's on definitely the there, club. Though, yeah, the club pleasure. Kids, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about you guys. <laughs> No, it's a very no, I mean, it's, it, that is one of our, you know, mm -hmm. the perfect student mm -hmm. list. Yeah. Critical thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. You know, Jordana. Jordana, one one thing about uh, what's in the curriculum, and, and and we as a local school board have have local control over that. But in my 19th year now on school boards, <laughs> I've I've been through the State Department <laughs> of Education when it back when it was the core curriculum standards when and when it was the yeah. thing before that. And in 19 years, there's only been more things that have gone into the curriculum, and I've yet to see anything ever come out of the curriculum. Yeah. And, Again, and so me, that's something we also have to be conscious it's, it's of. It's not the what so much as the how to me, and during my interview with Judy, I forget the exact question of she asked, that, she, that she asked me, but it's something like, oh, do you feel like we're preparing our students for the future kind of thing, and, and my answer was like, I mean, from a, from a knowledge perspective, data, sure. I mean, we're cramming lots of facts into their heads, but you guys know what happens five minutes after the <laughs> test is over. Come on, right? Versus teaching them how to think, right? That is going to last forever. And I just feel like, and, and it's not this school. I mean, I get it. It's our educational system. So, but you know what? We, we're empowered to control what we can control over here. So I have a lot of passion for, I know we've got the standards, I know this is complicated, but teach them how to think. They'll never forget that. I'm done. Okay. The rain is still on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I Any, anything, anything else or should I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All right. <laughs> Thank you.